Hello. So some of you might remember that back in April, I made a video about knitting machines or specifically the knitting machine that I had bought. I might also have mentioned that I bought another one, but I've not done anything with that since I got it. So um, we'll just pretend. Anyway, after the knitting machine video came out, Vincent, who as far as I can tell has come into my life purely to lead me into temptation, dropped me a message on Instagram and was like, hey, have you seen all of these excellent historical knitted objects? You could probably do those now. To which my response, was, oh yeah, that'd still be like really difficult, time consuming and quicker than hand knitting them. Anyway, fast forward to November and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna make an 18th century knitted waistcoat. How hard could it be? Anyway, so this waistcoat is from 1780 and it is in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. Now, we're not gonna get into my personal beef with the V&A. I don't know if I'm going to be able to show you these images. So if I can't, I'll put the accession number on the screen. You're just gonna have to look it up in your own time and follow along with me as I look at the object. It's a really unsatisfying video, I'm sorry. Okay, so what do we know? This is dated to approximately 1780. We know that it is cotton. It is described as frame knit. Getting to grips with 18th century frame knitting is a future project, one that we're not going to get into for this one, but basically a lot of knitting from kind of the 17th century onwards. Until the invention of the latch hook knitting machine, as far as I can tell, most like mass produced knitting was done on a knitting frame or a stocking frame. I don't know, but I'm going to reasonably assume that lace on a stocking frame worked the same as lace on my latch hook knitting machine is going to, which is that you have to put those eyelets in by hand. I don't think it's going to necessarily be a bad replica. You shall see. <laughs> so only the fronts have been knitted and then they're lined in cotton twill and the back is also cotton twill. It does, however, have lovely lacework designs. Looking at how the bottom corners cut off the lacework in a weird way, I think that this was knitted as a panel and then cut up and shaped to the design of the waistcoat. Yeah, the collar lace and the actual line of the collar doesn't line up at all. That's cool. I don't need to build shaping into my lace pattern unless I really want to. The main motifs seem to be the there's sort of a heart and floret. I'm going to call that a lily. I think lily is possibly what they were going for, but there is a heart and lily design that's made out of just eyelet lace. There are some smaller motifs. There's a nice wavy border that goes both horizontally and vertically and is slightly different in each one. Oh, and the pockets are completely different. There's the bottom lace border, which is alternating stacked heart and lily designs side by side. There's the vertical border that goes up the front which is alternating stacked heart and lily designs, two of them side by side, but in the other orientation, along with a little diamond and a little circle with the wavy border to one side and a straight border on the closure side. There is the neckband lace, which is just a single lily or heart. And this is a right way up heart with only one line of eyelets as opposed to the double eyelets. And that's just staggered single diagonal row with the double border either side, not wavy, just straight. And then there's the pocket flaps, which is something else entirely. The pocket flaps have the lily design, or it's a slightly different lily design in the center. And then a design of like differently nested diamonds. So I think we've established that there's a lot going on there. What am I going to do? Luckily, I already have a 1790s waistcoat pattern that I really like and really fits me. So I'm probably going to use that as a base instead of trying to come up with a pattern for an earlier one. So we'll grab that. The first thing to do whenever you're doing a machine knitting project is obviously to make swatches. So I'm going to make some plain knit swatches to see how I like the fabric that's coming out. And then uh, I guess I'm going to come up with the lace designs and then I'll need to swatch those as well. And only after I've done those two things will I be able to come up with a pattern. Because even if I'm just doing a rectangle and then cutting it up, which I probably won't do, but we'll see how it goes. I'm still going to need to watch it to figure out how big that panel needs to be. Cool, good stuff, let's go. 
So these are my swatches. Basically, you just knit a bunch of stitches, and I do what Carson at Knit Factory Impulse recommends, which is that you put a set of eyelets in to show what tension you were doing each swatch on. So you can see that these are the same yarn. One was knitted at tension three, and one was knitted at tension four. The tension four one is just slightly bigger. This is tension three. It's pretty dense. I found doing the eyelets a struggle. And then this is tension four. It's a bit more open. It's a bit more drapey. I think those eyelets look better than those eyelets. And since eyelets is the name of the game, I think we're going to knit at a tension four. That's the way to go. So next step, lace charts. So I don't typically make knitting patterns, but I maintain that making a chart is not in any way difficult. You just adjust your columns to be the same size as your rows in Excel and go to town. This is basically also the way I make weaving drafts, cross stitch patterns, colour work charts. I went through a brief stint 20 years ago of being really bad at pixel art, so I have sort of a grasp of what basic shapes look like when reduced to tiny squares, but the rest is just blind faith and temerity. I referenced the museum object pretty heavily while I did this, but it is not a one-to-one -one recreation. I know that my gauge will be really different, so I haven't, for example, counted to make sure I have the exact same number of eyelets. Instead, I focused on getting the proportions and the overall look to be as similar as possible. So in my last video, I don't think I talked about how you actually do lace. So this is how you do lace on a very basic knitting machine. And I imagine any knitting machine that doesn't have like a patterning system built in, this is what you're gonna do. So I'm gonna find where my next eyelet is gonna be, which is here. And use the tool to push it in and lift the stitch off. And then I'm gonna transfer it onto the stitch next to it by sort of catching it onto the hook and then pulling the needle out so both stitches are sat behind the latch. I like to leave these ones back just until I'm done the end of the row just because it helps me keep where my place is. So we'll do that again, push in, lift off, wiggle the other needle back till I can hook the stitch onto it. Make sure both stitches are behind the latch. This is one of the lilies, so it's just four stitches side by side. Now I'll count on to the next one, which is one, two, three, four, and on the fifth stitch. I almost always go to the left, just easier, but for some stitches it doesn't look right. So on this particular one, I've already learned on this sample that I want to go to the right. Just like with a hand knitting pattern, once it starts developing, you can sort of read the rows below. I do find that it tends to wiggle from side to side, so it's not always that <laughs> useful. I'm, I'm still counting for a lot of it, but with things like the lilies, which are just four big vertical columns of eyelets, instead of counting needles along, it's really easy just to go, yep, there they are. And then I'm done the row, bring all of these needles back into work and open the latches. So what happens when we take the yarn across this time that didn't have stitches on them will form loops. You can just see that there are little loose loops across some of the stitches. And so just like how you'd purl back to finish everything off, there's then just one plain row. All those loops get knitted and we're ready to go again on the next row. It takes me five or six minutes for each two rows, which is not that bad. But when you start adding it up, you know, guys, I think this was an expensive waistcoat. <laughs> OK, so this is the preliminary lace chart. Ignore that my printer is terrible. This is the preliminary lace chart for the vertical lace. So it's the triple border on both sides and then that heart and lily motif that I was talking about with the little extra detail details in there. Now I've actually already started knitting not this chart but the other chart and ran into a couple of problems almost immediately so I'll show you what I've done with the other chart just a sec. Big problem number one was that 
counting how many squares were between each. So each square is a stitch and counting how many stitches between each one got really complicated. So I started counting them and pre-filling in the numbers. Then because I'd done that, I was finding I was getting confused between the numbers and the little X's that indicate that there should be an eyelet there. So I color coded in all of the little eyelets except for where I've taped two bits together because my printer, I just couldn't get it to scale to fit onto one page, whatever. And then we get to the blue squares. So I thought I'd copied the pattern pretty well. I knew I couldn't have got it perfectly because, well, there's a bunch of reasons. I thought I'd done an okay job. However, on the photos, it looked like there were two eyelets side by side. And I just blindly copied that, forgetting, of course, that that doesn't really work in knitting. Maybe it works in frame knitting. I don't know. Maybe there's a way of doing this on the knitting machine. Even in hand knitting, if you try to do two eyelets side by side, normally they'd be like, do you want to put a stitch between those two? Because otherwise, how are we doing this? So I've come up with a workaround on the machine that I'll show you in a minute. This is what I'm currently working with and the easiest thing I found is just to cover it up one row at a time. And I use a couple of weights to hold this down flat and make sure that I'm, I'm only reading the row that I want to do at any given time. That's our chart situation right now. So a problem I've run into with the pattern is that it seems like there are two eyelets side by side. That's what I've done in the pattern, but of course you can't actually do that. If you do two eyelets side by side, what you actually get is one big eyelet. Clearly I'm going to have to adjust the pattern slightly on that one. So what I've been doing is this. Instead of just doing a pattern row and then a straight repeat, anything I've shaded in blue, so this one and this one, they need to happen on the return row, not the pattern row. And we're going to see how that looks because it really does look like that's what's happening in the pattern. There's not a stitch between them, but we will see. That's our lily, four stitches side by side, stacked on top of the four columns. And then we're going to count one, two, and then that's one. And normally I would do the next one directly next to it, but I'm going to do that on the return row. So then, as I said before, I don't like to count as much as the pattern develops, especially with stuff like the lilies. It's really easy to read off the lace so far. Four, count two. So I'm going to do that one and we'll do the stitch next to it on the return row. And then it's just important to make sure that you're not factoring that into your counting. So it's five to the next stitch, but I have to go one, one, two, three, four, five. Make sure everything back in work. And then normally I would just go straight back, but instead we're going to do the two blue stitches. And with these, I go to the other side for once. And they're really easy to spot because they're right next to an existing eyelet. There's not a lot of counting has to happen. In the past, I've talked a lot about how important having things at the appropriate height for your work is. Long time viewers of the channel will know that I have my cutting table very deliberately at elbow height on me. The desk I have my sewing machine on is set a little bit higher than a normal desk would be. But the more crafts you do, the less likely it is you're going to be able to have a dedicated work surface at the correct height for every individual thing that you're doing. And while I'm working on the knitting machine, especially doing a lot of fiddly lace detail, even on my cutting table, I kept having to bend down to look at it properly. Luckily, there is one easy solution to all of these problems and any future craft-based height problems that I might have, which is why I'm delighted to introduce you to this video's sponsor, FlexiSpot. I have a full-time office job on top of my YouTube work, and even with my best efforts, I spend sometimes 10 plus hours sitting down at desks that aren't really the right height for me in the first place. That's why the FlexiSpot E7 Pro Premium Standing Desk is an ideal choice. It gives me the flexibility to sit or stand and change my position as often as I need to throughout the day to keep my back and all my weirdly bad at their job joints happy. Nice. The desk is really robust, frame is made out of automotive grade steel, the motors are really sturdy, it can lift up to 440 pounds, and if you're not completely happy with it, they offer free returns within 30 days and a 15 year warranty. This is a bit much. I'm really happy with this. I can see myself using it a lot in my day-to-day -day life from now on. 
that's better. Obviously I got this to use it with a whole bunch of different crafting equipment. My partner is a four monitors because he doesn't quite have room for six kind of person and I can already see him eyeing this up. Yeah, I know it all fits, but I am gonna need that back. You can preset the height so it'll lift itself on a single touch and it also has a child safety lock so you can turn those features off if you don't want any little fingers getting in the way. Being able to move my knitting machine up and down as needed has really helped me complete the lace swatches for this project. Also, I normally can't put my camera on the same surface as my knitting machine because it vibrates a lot when I pull the carriage across. But with the E7 Pro, neither the machine nor raising or lowering the height causes the camera to shake at all. FlexiSpot provides all kinds of standing desks and ergonomic chairs to meet your demands. If you want a really stable frame for premium use, I'd recommend their E7 Plus standing desk with four-leg design. And they also have a comfortable ergonomic chair with flexible adjustment for your back. Use my promo code YTE7P50 for $50 off on their E7 Pro standing desk. So I finished the swatch. So let's just address the elephant in the room straight off the bat. It's huge. Just proportional to my body, these like four motifs would be the whole bottom of the waistcoat. That is not consistent with the historical example. It is way too big. I thought I knew from the beginning that it was being done on a much finer yarn. For some reason I didn't factor that in. I don't hate it. I actually think I've done a pretty good job. This is... I was in the process of blocking this. It's still damp. I'll put some close-ups in so you can see it better. This is not bad. It's just really big. This isn't completely dry, but I think if you compare it to the chart... I mean, it's backwards, let's start there. I would have to remember that this comes out the other way around. It's not bad. I think it's got a similar kind of density to the original. I, I think I should have done a few more rows to really that. It's quite difficult to see the top border because it keeps curling. I did also, there's a couple of places where I've just dropped stitches. That's user error. If it wasn't a swatch, I probably should have stopped and taken it off, but it is something to bear in mind for when I do this properly. Overall, I'm not unhappy with it. I'm going to make some small tweaks. Like I don't think those double side-by-side -side eyelets worked very well at all. You can see here that that's supposed to be one and it's just not really worked. That's supposed to be another one. It doesn't look good. So we'll have to figure something else out but adding in extra stitches shouldn't be quite so much of a problem because <laughs> there is absolutely no way that we'll be doing it this size of yarn because this is way too big. <laughs> Where do we go from here? A couple of big obvious things. This yarn is not going to work. My machine will do much finer yarns. That's a vintage three ply so we could go down to a lace weight or possibly possibly even less. It's going to be interesting to see what like tension one on my machine will do with a really, really fine yarn. But that's going to take a while. <laughs> I was not expecting to have to source a new yarn. There's going to be a whole process to that. I also have not even yet got onto the pattern and whether or not I can pattern a knitted waistcoat front. So anyway, we're going to break this down into smaller chunks. I'm going to start looking for a different yarn, do some test swatches of different yarns that I already have or or maybe buy something. I hope I don't have to buy something until I get a fabric that I'm happy with and then do the lace swatches again. <laughs> they take so long. It's quite boring too. Anyway, in the meantime, I need to figure out whether making a knitted front waistcoat is actually doable or not. So I think parallel to that, I will be attempting to pattern out, possibly using this yarn and just doing it in plain knit, a knitted waistcoat front that goes with my waistcoat pattern. I guess in theory, that means I should finally show you guys how I make those waistcoats. I keep threatening to do it and then just don't. Then once we've established that I can make a knitted waistcoat front, not a guarantee, Tea, and we found a yarn that is suitably fine and we've figured out that I can produce a lace that I'm happy with on my knitting machine. Also not a guarantee. In theory I should be able to combine the two and then produce a lace knitted waistcoat front. Not a guarantee! I thought this was going to be like a fun project to bust out before Christmas but this has just exploded way beyond the scope of anything I considered doing. <laughs> anyway I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you are interested in machine knitting there are better people to learn from than me. Carson at Knit Factory Impulse has been the source of a lot of my like 
hands-on tutorial stuff. I'm pretty sure I can already hear Carson's voice in the back of my head going, you know what would have made this a lot easier? AYAB. But if you're looking for more just sort of general inspiration, engineering knits, does a lot of machine knitting stuff, I particularly like a channel called A Dream Goes West. You should all join me in trying to persuade them to do more machine knitting videos because they're really good. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to keep the YouTube gods happy. Thank you once again to FlexiSpots for sponsoring this video. I am really looking forward to reducing my amount of lower back pain. If you'd like to get a standing desk of your own, the FlexiSpot Black Friday sale is now live. Do go and check out the link in my description. And don't forget to use my code YTE7P50 to get an extra $50 off selected models. Follow me on Instagram if you'd like to see pictures of my cat. And so, you can, down in the description box, find a link to my Ko-fi page where you can make a one-off or recurring donation to support this channel. However, you can now also become a member of the channel. This is something I've been thinking about for a while. I've got plans right now. It's just same as Ko-fi, $2.99 a month. You'll get early access to the videos and cute little badges and emojis. I'm still working on those, but there will be Thursday emojis. I'm gonna make Thursday emojis happen. Both of these are great ways to support the channel and me and let me spend more time failing to make historical costuming projects apparently. But no matter how you choose to support the channel, even if you're just watching the videos and liking and subscribing, I couldn't do what I do without your help. Dream big and I'll see you for what might be the next installment of this project or depending on how hard I rage quit, might be something completely different. See you next time.